Let's look at a set of eigenvector problems associated with the Hamiltonian of a particle in a central potential. As shown in the last lecture, this Hamiltonian is invariant under rotations and therefore commutes with angular momentum. So these two operators can share the same eigenstates. However, according to the commutation relations of L, Different components of L do not commute with each other. So a state could be a shared eigenstate of H with at most one component of L. But because L is a vector operator, L square must be invariant under all rotations, and as a result, commutes with all the components of angular momentum. H also commutes with L square as it does with every component. Thus we have three operators which mutually commute with each other and can therefore share the same eigenstates. The third component of L is chosen purely by convention. It corresponds to an axis with special significance in some physical problems, as we shall see. These commutation relations will provide powerful constraints that will simplify the eigenvector problems. Here's a preview of the solutions. Psi is the shared eigenstate of all three operators. Both the eigenvalues of L square and L3 are quantized by some integers, L and M. Why this is so will be explained in a minute. We first examine the angular momentum operator in more details. Let's look at L in position space. What is the effect of Li on an arbitrary state psi projected into position space? Using the definition in the blue box, the position operator could act towards its left on the position state and be replaced by its eigenvalue. The effect of Pk on bra x is also known as we have derived it in lecture 2. This gives us the action of the operator Li on an arbitrary wave function psi in position space. Let's replace the partial derivative with respect to x with a more compact notation which is also the notation used by Weinberg. Because psi is an arbitrary wave function in position space, we now have the representation of Li in position space. Note that we can get this from the definition of angular momentum in the blue box, by replacing the x and p operators by their representations in position space. Speaking of position space, let's choose a coordinate system that will be useful for a system with rotational symmetry. We are of course talking about spherical coordinates. In this coordinate system, the rotation of a point about any axis which goes through the origin is just purely a change in angular variables, theta and phi. This immediately implies that the generator of rotations, L, must also depend only on angular variables. This is the kind of simplification we are expecting. Our task now is to convert to spherical coordinates from Cartesian ones, including all the differential operators in position space, especially the angular momentum operator. Our starting point is the relation between the Cartesian and spherical coordinates in the blue box. This is apparent from the figure. As a hint, R sine theta is just the length of the yellow line.
The differential operators in Cartesian coordinates on the left-hand side of the equal signs are related to the spherical ones by the chain rule of partial derivatives. The connective derivative functions in the green boxes can be calculated from the yellow box above. This is what we will do now. Let's begin with x3. The derivative in the green box is the easiest to solve. No calculations are required. Just by looking at the previous figure, it's apparent that the coordinate x3 can be changed without varying the angle phi. Therefore, the derivative in the green box is just zero. Now look at the equation in the blue box. Suppose we take the partial derivative with respect to x3 on both sides of the equation. This relates the two remaining derivatives with respect to x3 in the green boxes. Let's first figure out the derivative of r by x3, then the corresponding derivative of theta will automatically be solved. For this, we can just use the Pythagoras relation between r and the Cartesian coordinates. This derivative is easy. Note that due to the symmetry of all three Cartesian coordinates in the Pythagoras relation, the derivative in the yellow box holds for any component. This is good to remember. We shall use it again. The numerator in the yellow box is just minus sine squared theta. This simplifies to So we have del3 in terms of spherical coordinates. One down, two more to go. Let's now do del1. Once again, we could get a constraint equation relating the derivatives of both r and theta with respect to x1 using the equation in the blue box. Taking derivatives on both sides of this equation, we have This allows us to express the theta derivative in terms of the one on r. And we already know the result for r from before in the yellow box. So the derivative on theta in the green box is basically solved. Substituting the derivative of r into the red box. Now both the derivatives of theta and r are known. To proceed further, let's look at the next equation in the blue box. Taking derivatives with respect to x1 on both sides of this equation. We then substitute the derivatives of r and theta into this equation.
The equation in the blue box will give us the derivative of the angle phi. This term can obviously be simplified. Thus we now have all three connective functions that will give us del1. Let's substitute all these back into the equation for del1. Thus del1 is solved. Let's work on del2. However, we need not do any more calculations. We can just infer the result from del1. Here's how. By observing the relation between the equations in the blue boxes, we notice that x1 changes into x2 if the angle phi is shifted in this way. This shift causes the following changes in these trigonometric functions making the connection above obvious. In the same way, the derivative by x1 is connected to x2 by the same transformations. The transition to spherical coordinates is now complete. In the next lecture, we shall use all of these to derive a spherical representation of angular momentum.